putting the name Kennedy on a presidential campaign brings immediate attention and some controversy. Uh, I think the Democratic Party is increasingly dependent on corporate money. I think there's concern that if they elect a, a populist candidate, the corporate faucets will be shut off. This week, the name you know and a few things you may not know about Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Golf, considered the ultimate gentleman's sport, until billions of dollars created an unseemly turf war. What is the amount of the Saudi investment that is going to be made? North of one billion. We take a look at how a sports merger has included victims of the 9-11 attacks and sparked an investigation going all the way to Capitol Hill. And if you've ever felt a brief panic from empty shelves at the supermarket, we'll show you how America's green acres are becoming increasingly high tech. Welcome to Full Measure. I'm Cheryl Ackeson. Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s run for president might be seen as a logical extension of an American political dynasty. His uncle was President John F. Kennedy. His father was Attorney General and presidential candidate Robert F. Kennedy. Both were assassinated. Another uncle was a lion of the Democrat Party, Senator Ted Kennedy. But this Kennedy is running a very different race than his family forefathers. Shunned by his own party, refused Secret Service protection by the Biden administration, Kennedy says he's being forced to consider a giant move, leaving his political party. If he does, it stands to upend campaign 2024 in an unexpected way. Could he draw enough votes away from the two nominees to make a difference? We spoke with Kennedy in New Jersey. A Rasmussen Reports poll just found that one in three Democrats say they might vote for you if you were to leave the Democrat Party and run as a third party candidate. What thoughts do you have about that? If the Democratic Party does not allow me to actually have a fair election, in other words, if they you know, continue doing what they're doing, which is to rig the outcome of the election, uh, then I would, uh, I would look at all options. Can you explain in simple terms what the Democrat Party is doing to discourage your candidacy? One of the most, I think, egregious thing is that they've passed a rule that says that any candidate who steps into New Hampshire, um, that no vote that is cast for that candidate in New Hampshire will, uh, will count toward them. And so I have campaigned in New Hampshire. I've been campaigning there from the beginning. And every delegate that I win from New Hampshire um, will go instead to President Biden. And they have the potential to do the same thing in Iowa. It's more akin to what we saw in the Soviet Union during you know, the, the Soviet era, when the political party, in that case the Communist Party, was claiming that they had a democracy. But the way they control the democracy is the party alone could designate who the nominees were. And so the only people the public could vote on were candidates that were chosen by the party apparatchiks rather than, you know, the public. Why do you think the Democrat Party is so against your candidacy? Lifelong Democrat, Kennedy is a Democrat Party name. Uh, I think the Democratic Party is increasingly dependent on corporate money and that um, they... I think there's concern that if they elect a, a populist candidate like Tulsi Gabbard or Bernie Sanders or myself, that the, the corporate faucets will be shut off. You know, it really is that Uniparty and both parties are involved with protecting those corporate donors and then the same corporate donors. Um, and I think that frightens them that um, that, that, uh, that that flow of money would be shut off. The Twitter files revealed that you were targeted by government and vaccine interests for questions you raised and information you distributed about COVID and COVID vaccines, even when it was absolutely true. What are your thoughts about that? 
that. So they couldn't find anything that I wrote that was actually misinformation, that was erroneous. So they made up a new word, which is malinformation. And malinformation is information that is true, but nevertheless inconvenient for government. And they began censoring me on that. There were literally thousands of people who ended up being censored. Mothers who reported that their child had been injured by a medical product were abolished. Doctors who saw patients who were injured or who had treatment regimens that, you know, that they felt worked to restore people, they were removed from the social media. And, uh, and then any discussion of scientific articles, even publications of CDC's own website that showed things that were critical of, of vaccine safety. You know, it wasn't good for public health and it wasn't good for our democracy. So how do you prevent something like that from happening? Well, as president, I would, I would prevent it by issuing an executive order immediately. Then I would try to pass legislation as well, and particularly the intelligence agencies. Um, need, you know, we need to get a handle on them because as we now know, the FBI had opened a portal um, so that they could directly censor uh, Facebook and Twitter. And they were allowing the CIA also to censor people that they didn't want, censor discussions that they did not want to occur uh, in public. You've spoken more than any candidate that I've heard about, about really a really big problem, chronic health disorders that are plaguing our society, our children, and adults as well, such as immune disorders like juvenile diabetes, Crohn's, POTS, celiac disease, as well as disorders like autism, the epidemic that has not been successfully addressed even by the most well-funded public health agencies in the world. What would you do about that? Well, we've gone to, from having 6% of Americans have chronic disease when my uncle was president to, uh, probably around 60% now. We don't really know because NIH won't publish the numbers uh, or do the studies. And we're the, we have the sickest generation of kids that we've ever had in our country, and we are the sickest country in the world. So you have to figure out an exposure that hit all Americans, every demographic beginning around 1989. There's a limited number of them. High fructose corn syrup, um, cell phone radiation and, you know, their PFOAs, which are flame retardants that were put in a lot of products, our children's pajamas and almost every piece of furniture at that time. Um, and, and then the vaccine schedule that, of course, went from three vaccines I had as a kid to 72 vaccines over a very short period of time during that period. And all of those diseases, by the way, are listed on the manufacturers inserts for those 72 vaccines as potential side effects. So those have to be a culprit too. Um, it's probably a combination of all of these, you know, um, uh, insults. I'm going to go down to Bethesda to NIH headquarters and I'm going to say to them, we're going to shift a lot of our focus now from development of incubating pharmaceutical drugs, pharmaceutical products, which is what NIH does, a lot of them to treat the chronic disease that they're causing. And I'm going to say, we're going to start figuring out what's causing the chronic disease. Um, and there's a lot of other things that need to be done. We need to get uh, pharmaceutical advertising off of TV so that the television stations can return to telling the truth to the American public about health. Uh, rather than serving as propagandists for this very, very corrupt industry. What are your answers or thoughts as to what you would do about the situation with Ukraine and all of the money that's going out the door now? Well, with Ukraine, uh, you know, I will settle the war very, very quickly as soon as I get into office. Um, the Russians have tried to settle it twice um, on terms that were very, very beneficial to us. And in both cases, the United States government blew up those agreements. And Why do you think that is? I think that the U.S. Um, wanted the war. So you have Republicans and Democrats on both sides who are saying, you know, the real objective of this war is to degrade the Russian army for strategic reasons. And, and Ukraine has ended up as a pawn in a proxy war between the United States and Russia. 
uh, I think it's a bad uh, policy. I don't think our objective should be to degrade the Russian capacity. I don't think Russians threaten the United States. Russia had a defensive capacity, but they've never done anything to develop a, an offensive, you know, imperialistic capacity. What is the status of Secret Service protection for you? We've made uh, multiple applications for Secret Service protection, and the, uh, the Biden administration has denied me. What reason are they giving you? They, uh, they don't really give a reason. They just say that they don't. The White House has determined that um, it's unnecessary. I've had home invasions by intruders. Since I declared, I've had, you know, people, so a man got up to the second floor of my house who had tried to invade Kennedy homes before. Uh, you know, I think the Biden administration has decided to play hardball. And they know that 30% of the money that we raise for my campaign, I have to spend on private security. Former President Trump, when I asked the question, said he knows you, he likes you, and he could see working with you in some capacity. What do you think? I think that's very nice of President Trump to say that. <laughs> Could you see yourself working in any capacity with Donald Trump? I, I mean, I, that's not a job that I would look for. If I'm not able to, to run things, uh, I, I would not want to be in government at all. We'll be hearing from other candidates in the weeks ahead. One note, we've been asking Joe Biden for an interview since 2019 and are still hoping he'll agree at some point. Ahead on Full Measure, should American athletes participate in Saudi sports? Congress is now investigating Saudi Arabia's recent takeover of America's Professional Golfers Association, or PGA. Critics say it's the kingdom's latest play to use sports to whitewash Saudi Arabia's dark human rights reputation and even lingering controversies over the 9-11 attacks. Fifteen of the 19 Islamic extremist hijackers were Saudis. Lisa Fletcher has more. Tough driving hole. The Saudi-backed Men's Golf League, LIV, debuted in 2022 to compete with the PGA Tour. It's backed by the country's half-trillion-dollar investment fund, which threw crazy money at the game's top names to pull them away from the rival PGA Tour and secure them to the LIV brand. Phil Mickelson is among them and was reportedly paid some $200 million just to sign a contract with LIV. PGA Tour Commissioner Jay Monahan pushed back, suspending all players taking part in the first LIV tournament and lobbied Congress and 9-11 victim families to help the tour fight the Saudi enterprise. A court battle ensued and the PGA fought hard against the Saudi investment they said could destroy the American sports institution. Then, in June, the PGA flip-flopped and announced it was working on a deal to merge with LIV. The Senate Homeland Security Investigative Subcommittee launched an inquiry into what was actually happening. We'll come to order. Chairman Richard Blumenthal, a Democrat, is leading the bipartisan probe. We're here because we're concerned about the PGA Tours deal in terms of what it means for an authoritarian government to use its wealth to capture American institutions. Senators pressed PGA Tour executives Ron Price and Jimmy Dunn for nearly three hours in front of a hearing room crowded with 9-11 victims' families. What is, what is the amount of the Saudi investment that is going to be made? North of $1 billion. I don't really buy the argument that they had to do it. They put up a chart today that they had $1.2 billion in revenue. I think that they saw an opportunity. Mr. Dunn's a deal maker. He saw an opportunity. He smelled blood in the water. Brett Eagleson is the founder of the group 9-11 Justice and was 15 when his father Bruce was killed in the World Trade Center attacks. Look, for the last year and a half, the PGA used our talking points. They used these documents. They used all the rhetoric about human rights. And behind closed doors, they folded like a beach chair. The very minute that they got offered a pot of money, they took it. Terry Strada's husband, Tom, was also a victim of the Twin Tower attacks. 
It isn't a deal. It's a hostile takeover of one of our most treasured sports. Strata says Saudi Arabia is using billions to make over its public image. They want a platform to sports wash away their crimes against humanity, to, to look better to the world. They want the people to forget how they used to spend their billions, which was supporting terrorism and al-Qaeda and the September 11th attacks. While Democrats and Republicans on the committee shared antitrust concerns about a potential monopoly, given the early stage of the merger, some argued Congress should stay out of it. There's nothing wrong with the PGA Tour negotiating its survival. We sat down with Senator Ron yeah, Johnson after the so, hearing. Again, it was an existential threat for the PGA Tour, so what, what else were they supposed to do? What are our priorities if we're putting the survival of the PGA over what many people see as a national security threat to allow the Saudis to reach that deeply into an American institution like the PGA. If there truly was a national security threat with the Saudis, we ought to stop buying their oil. We ought to stop filling the coffers of the public investment fund. Uh, we haven't done that. What, expecting that the PGA Tour is supposed to bear the full burden of holding Saudi Arabia accountable, for example, the brutal assassination of Khashoggi, or responsible for those Saudi citizens that uh, funded uh, terrorism? Terry Strada hopes the Saudis' flashy makeover using famous athletes doesn't fool anyone because just below the surface lurks a regime tied to one of the darkest days in America's history. Some people might say, look, these are two completely different issues, Saudi Arabia and the PGA Tour and 9-11 families. Is it two separate discussions? No, because it's sports washing. If we don't hold them accountable, who's to say any of this has ever stopped? And what are they planning next? For the next move from Congress, the Homeland Security Committee has signed off on a subpoena to investigate the Saudi investment fund behind the huge Gulf merger. For Full Measure, I'm Lisa Fletcher in Washington, D.C. Coming up on Full Measure, from hands-free tractors to smart sprayers and irrigation apps, it's not your daddy's farm. With the help of technology, America's farms have advanced from iron plows to milking robots. It turns out cutting-edge technology is now key to positioning the U.S. to become more food independent. Scott Thuman reports from the field in Georgia. For as long as anyone can remember, it's been the way of the world. A tried and true process, tilling the soil to put food on the plate and some money in the pockets of those working the land. But farming is no longer just about tradition. More and more, it's about technology. We use satellite imagery once a week over all the fields. In uh, southwest Georgia, Adam McClendon and his family have been farming peanuts, cotton, and corn for five generations. One of the biggest challenges is dealing with Mother Nature and, and being able to adapt and overcome what, uh, what the weather throws at you. But made easier these days by those subtle little posts poking up through his fields. Ten years ago, to uh, check the pivots and see what's broken down, you drive to every pivot, look out your truck window, see if it's walking, sit there for three or four minutes and watch the tires move and, and move on along to the next one. Just that one example from an irrigation standpoint is a game changer. Algorithms now remotely adjusting water and energy use on those pivots with the touch of a button. And it's not just on the ground tech, it's also above. Constant satellite monitoring can now tell farmers when part of a crop, often hard to spot in the middle of a field, is suffering. Saving valuable resources are ways farmers can be more productive, essential if America is going to achieve food independence. While we are the world's biggest agricultural exporter, selling $196 billion in 2022, our food imports are also growing and expected to reach $200 billion this year. The drive to improve farming is quite literal 
for University of Georgia professor Simmer Ver. Exactly. I can focus on the task we're doing, you know, not steering the tractor. With his hands off the wheel, he is trying to determine which tractor's GPS abilities are best to more precisely navigate crops, minimizing damage and maximizing the yield. And smart sprayers operate only when needed, dramatically reducing the amount of pesticides and fertilizers used. So when you've got weeds to kill, you're not spraying the whole field anymore. If we don't need to spray the whole field, but only targeting the weed, why spray the whole field? Let's just target the weed and be more efficient with it. What Virk is researching is called precision agriculture. It's also the focus of intense study in these University of Georgia fields. Using advanced computer systems to give crops what they need, no more, no less. Calvin Perry is one of the pioneers of farming's fast-moving, high-tech transition. How big of a contrast are you seeing in farming when it comes to technology from 30 years ago to now? I think if you were Rip Van Winkle and, and woke up today and compared yourself to 30 years ago, you would just be blown away. Now, if you go to sleep for five years and wake up, I think you're going to see that curve even more steep. So how much could these advancements really save farmers? And here in Georgia and just in the south part of the state, we're talking upwards of 9,000 center pivots. If we put it on 85% of those, just think of the water savings percentage-wise that we could achieve. Bringing down overall costs for consumers and allowing farmers like McClendon to reap more from what he sows. Can farming survive if you don't advance with technology? I don't think so. For Full Measure, I'm Scott Thuman in Georgia. After a break, what's ahead next week on Full Measure? Coming up next week on Full Measure, an exclusive examination of key moments captured on video inside the Capitol on January 6th. Numerous law enforcement experts have reviewed the images with us and identified questionable handling of key instigators by police. The first thing you gotta do is you gotta get rid of the troublemakers. I didn't see key provocateurs removed from the crowd. In fact, the key provocateurs in this case seem to be sort of tolerated, if not encouraged, by some of the police officers on the front line. They were, they were definitely tolerated. What role did undercover agents and informants play in the January 6th protests and riots? Our year-long investigation next week on Full Measure. Until next time, we'll be searching for more stories that hold powers accountable. Thanks for watching. I'm Cheryl Atkinson.